You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Hello, welcome to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. I'm your host, Saul Muerte, ready to delve into what will be the final podcast for this current season, which we have been dedicating to John Carpenter's work, but we're going to shift gears a bit. We do often take a bit of time aside and spend a bit of love towards Stephen King's work. He has become so, as you people out there, fans of the horror would know that he is synonymous to the genre and has uh, made countless films, uh, well, made countless films. His books have become countless films um, a co- throughout the course of his career um, and, and quite heavily around like the 80s period. And so we have kind of been talking about Christine was in there and we've spoken about uh, Pet Cemetery as well amongst uh, a couple of others that I can talk about off the top of my head. Uh, and now it's the time to turn to Misery, which was a film that um, was based on the same self-titled book, and uh, which was released in 1987. And the book, it's uh, sorry, the film itself actually came up three years later in 1990, which was uh, directed by, by Rob Reiner. Now, Rob Reiner was no stranger to uh, Stephen King either, having directed Stand by Me uh, in 1986, some a few years before that. Uh, but he was also, it's probably fair to say, more known for comedy than he was for a kind of horror or even kind of straight up drama. You know, he did This Is Spinal Tap, The Sure Thing, uh, The Princess Bride and When Harry Met Sally, all before this happened. Um, and uh, and literally a couple of years after this, he did You Can't Handle the Truth with a few good men. Uh, but that's aside, this is Rob Reiner's work. So he these are all big titles that he's done. So he's no stranger to kind of going big. And I guess the last thing to kind of just mention before I introduce my offside of it today is that this film in turn would also bag uh, Oscar for its um, lead actress, Kathy Bates, playing the role of Annie Wilkes. Um, but also she picked up a Golden Globe as well. So she's got double the, uh, double the money, double the money. Uh, for the uh, for her role as Annie Wilkes and probably deserve it too because it's an iconic role, um, the equivalent of what we would call a Karen these days. So now we're going to move on to introducing uh, my offside as we kind of discuss this. And some of you who have listened in the past may well start guessing who this is because I often call on him when we talk about Stephen King novels turned into films. And that's Watch It Wombat's Nick Orford. Welcome aboard, sir. Hey, Sol. Thanks very much. Good to be here as always. Good to have you on board, and I and uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or not that I keep calling you back for the Stephen King thing, but I do like to go to the people that are familiar with the work uh, and when I kind of call on these guys, and I know that we are, have a, a mutual love for Stephen King's written work. Um, Definitely. So, and I guess before we kind of delve into the movie, as I said, it's based on the novel he released in 1987. Um, ha- had you read the book before the film? Have you read the book, I should say, first? No, no, not, not this one. I've not watched the, book, the, I've just watched the, the film. film. Cool. Just the film, yeah. I've watched the film quite a few times, actually. But, yeah, never read the book. Yeah, so I... I and I think... Um, no, I, the book I got of Misery was actually a, a, a trio with a uh, company with The Shining and Carrie as an um, as all three in, in the same book. <laughs> uh, and I, I... Look, I went through, and I think I've said this to you before, and... and podcast of old that um i went through a big phase of reading stephen king kind of in my early teens uh and couldn't get enough of him so i you know i I absorbed this stuff so i definitely read it around that time i don't know so much if i picked up the book again but like you have watched the movie a number of times um and it was interesting reading the novel again before we came to record today um, because um, there's there's a notable difference that goes on in there, and I, and I may mention that along the way as we kind of start talking through the piece. But one of the big things was the uh, introduction in the movie of Richard Farnsworth's sheriff character. Uh, love him and and his wife. Uh, but I love it too. Like Richard Farnsworth. Now I, I haven't got his credits in front of me, but like you know he was in. Uh, and this is a, probably not the best example of. Oh, was he in Anna Green Gables? Anyway, I think he was. Uh, he was in Straight Story. Straight Story was the one um, I was going to immediately go to. Um, yeah, that's he, he's, it. he's this kind of like real, often this really uh, lovable kind of grandpa figure. Um, and with a little bit of quirkiness in there too. 
um, in the roles he plays. And, and he's no different here. And now, I don't know if you remember uh, when we, we had a chat or we were, I don't know if we ended up recording it, but we were due to record um, another Stephen King film, uh, uh, which, no, oh, yeah, no, I just remember it, so I'll go back and say that again. We were, we, mm-hmm. I can't remember if we ended up, I don't think we did end up doing the podcast for it, but we were due to, and, and just the way things haven't feel, things fell through, but we were going to talk about the dark half. And this was uh, a film that was directed by George Romero back when we were doing the Romero sessions. Um, so this is a film that starred Timothy Hutton as uh, a writer with a split personality and his personality, his darker half, uh, manifests into a real being. Um, and there's a character in that, which is a policeman that follows that journey. And when I was re-watching Misery this time, I kind of felt like, it was similar to the character that was that was used in that, you know, and I was as the police ca- policeman character, and like even like the relationship that he because he talks to his wife in it too, and there was this similar kind of energy about it. And I was like, I wonder if Rob Reiner was just lifting a little bit out of that to plot in here, just to because otherwise, like you are literally talking about uh, being locked up in one location, and that's kind of a hard thing to sell a story or or present a film around that without breaking outside of the four walls, so to speak, to show you something else. And this is kind of what the Farnsworth character d- does. Um, and we look in these podcasts, we jump around a heck of a lot. So we're not going to stick to plot narrative in this one. And I'm going to immediately jump to the end of this film because, um, <laughs> like yeah, a star, yeah. <laughs> because, uh, because we get so, uh, and it's purely because we're talking about the Farnsworth character and I should probably look up his name in, as I'm chatting away. Um, but as he is, uh, pursuing, uh, this lead of, uh, Paul Sheldon, the writer who has a romantic novelist writer, who's famous for his trademark character, the film, say, uh, misery, Chastain. Um, has finished his book when he has his, this car accident and then he's, he disappears from Trace from the point of view of the outside world. And this uh, Farnsworth character is, uh, is the sheriff that's then trying to track, uh, track down what could potentially have happened to uh, Paul Sheldon. And because he's this, like, he's this local kind of you know, sheriff, essentially, who... He's in the back of, it's the back of beyond. It's not really, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like a local kind of American town, essentially. Oh, his character's name is Buster. I've just found it out, looked up there. And his wife is played by Frances Sternhagen, who also cropped up in, uh, I want to say it may have been the TV adaptation of The Green Mile, not the film. Um, so she's no stranger to, Stephen King either she's probably known well for I remember her playing Carter's mum in ER um <laughs> so um <laughs> I'm sure yeah. that's top of her list of credits yeah, exactly she's probably been a load more things than that but the relationship is really endearing is my point and so they have this real kind of warm energy and a lot of the comedy elements come out of this if you don't take into consideration James Kahn's little quizzical raises of the eyebrow moments to Annie Wilkes's odd behavior, which is quite funny. Um, but yeah, they're, they're kind of, they feel like they're the heart of the movie because J- James Caan, all due respect is restrained for a lot of the film. Like, see, he can only rely on his, his facial expressions to emote and, and uh, rather than his physical uh, emo- um, expressions. Um, and I'm going to, put a pin in that for the moment to kind of just focus on the Farnsworth character, because when it comes yeah. to that end moment, he, uh, so he, he's the one that stumbles into Annie Wilkes' house at the very end. And you're thinking, is this the point where, uh, Paul Sheldon's going to get out or, you know, is he going to get saved or, you know, cause it's been leading up to it. Cause it's this, this guy is a very clever cop. Um, and he's been putting these pieces together and slowly kind of narrowing things down to kind of go, yeah, it's got to be around this location somewhere if he's, if he's turned up. Um, and so there's that casual chat he has with Annie Wilkes. So she's trying to 
hide the fact that she's got this guy in the basement downstairs and then um, Paul Sheldon's rumbling around under there, knocks over a barbecue, I think, which raises the awareness of, of Richard Farnsworth's character. He comes back in, opens the basement door, Paul Sheldon's saying, look, help me, help me, help me. And I think he said, Mr. Sheldon? And then all of a sudden he's chest bursts open um, from, yeah. a, from a shotgun and he's killed. Um, and at that moment, you're just like, fuck, you've just literally blown the heart out of the movie um, by killing this really kind of lovable character. I mean, what were your oh, thoughts beautiful. on that moment, mate? <laughs> oh, it was so tense because you're, you're really conflicted. You're there going, I want him to find him, but I also don't want him to so he can piss off and be safe. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. You, yeah. You, you want so much from that scene. And, uh, yeah, you're thinking, oh, well, go in, you know, you're trying to will him to... I don't know, when you're watching it for the first time to, I don't know, call for help or, or do something else, you know. But at, at that time, you put yourself into the cop situation, going, okay, well, what would be the protocol? What would you do? And it is just a noise. And then, you know, before you even had a chance to do any of that, bang, you know, he's got a hole in him. And, and it has been such a, a nice little cutaway, you know, throughout the entire film to have that sort of movement and life from the elderly couple. That's right. You know, to going out to... Um, doesn't he start looking at the the paper purchases or something or one of the leads from from what she was buying either way there's something that helps tie tie it back yeah yeah he he was reading one of the books essentially and and he realizes that uh he starts to pick up on habits that uh paul sheldon does like he always goes to the same location when he writes his novels which is yeah back, back of beyond place and little things like that that start piecing things together about understanding who paul sheldon is in order to kind of like track down his whereabouts essentially um but like that yeah, and he, go on sorry no i was gonna say and he invests so much time and effort into it and does so much great sort of police work yeah and, and at first you kind of think oh he's a doddering old guy you know too old for this shit yeah um you know on his way to retirement but he's, he's still got it and he's still following it through and um yeah that's kind of what i love about him and like you say shooting the literal heart out of the film. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like... Because, uh, you know, yeah. James Kahn's character, he's, he's great and he wants to survive and everything, but he doesn't come across as the most likeable character either. Uh, no, and he's and not. And that's, a, and that's what's quite... That's what's good about the Paul Sheldon character because he's not... An, he isn't really a nice guy. And this, this is... If you're going to look at the story arc of, who Paul, uh, of Paul Sheldon, he starts off as this real kind of... He's a real arrogant kind of character, really. Like, he... He's fed up of writing about these misery characters and he ends up writing this other novel um, at the beginning, which is like a, it's like the uh, polar opposite of these Victorian era romances that he's been writing. Um, and it's a crime novel. It's called Fast Cars. It has a character in there who's just swears a cockadoodle um, amount, of, <laughs> amount of times in it, you know. So, um yeah, so it's kind of like uh, it's it's like he's it's him pulling the bandaid off. He's he's pissed off with it, and a lot of these characteristics is you can kind of see potentially what he's been bottling up all this time. And he's I want to say he's been married um, and divorced, so he's like you know he's not um, he's he's known for kind of being a bit of a um, uh, not really tying down to anybody. You know, he's been a bit. So this again kind of uh, comes back to the fact that he's not somebody that's willing to put up with being in a relationship with somebody. And then, you know, he's in, he ends up facing probably his worst fears in that he is forced to literally stay in a relationship with somebody in order to yeah. try and survive. And, you know, so um, you do wonder how much of Stephen King's kind of mindset where I was creeping out into this and like, you know, of, you know, what was he doing with that time? Like he's known, well, he's gone on record now for uh, going for a, a period of like what was known as his, probably his best sellers where he was under the influence. Um, mm. So, you know, I don't know what stage of this comes in or whether it's at the end of that and he's coming out of this kind of uh, frenzied moment and trying to, you know, rehabilitate himself. Um but yeah, apparently, the, sorry, yeah, go on, mate. Sorry, yeah. just on that. No, I just read an article that said um, apparently Kathy Bates's character represents drugs. Ah, oh, um, cool. Or 
his addiction to drugs, I should say. Yeah. And um, and obviously he was James Khan and he was just saying, yeah, the drugs just wouldn't leave him alone and wouldn't let him go. And he was kind of trapped. And I was like, oh, wow. Because I almost sort of imagined it being, you know, without the extreme, I imagine it's still been quite literal, like with the fans and the pressure. And she was that sort of representation of, you know, instead of romantic novels, it's horror and you might want to change genres and blah, blah, blah. But uh, yeah, according to, I think it was an article in the French newspaper, he was saying how he wanted to, uh, or that, that, she represented, you know, his, his addiction and how he couldn't escape it. Yeah, that kind of that makes sense too, because the novel plays on like the literal, de- literal dependency on the drugs that he has, the painkillers that he has to have, and he he can't go on without that. And then where, there's a moment where they kind of do it a bit in in the novel to in the movie too, where uh, Annie Wilkes leaves him, and it's the bit where she goes, "It's raining. I always get the blues when it's raining," and then she kind of walks mm. off. But in the novel, she actually goes away and leaves him on his own in the house for, for a couple of days. Um, so he, that's where he kind of gets out of his room and you know, goes in search of, of drugs to kind of help him. <laughs> um, and, and I think, I can't remember if that's the moment with the penguin moment happens or not, or whether that happens later on in the book. I, because there's a couple of times he gets out. And the interesting thing is, is that um, in the novel, he actually remembers which way around the penguin was when he knocks it over and he puts it back the right way in the, oh, in, right. in the movie, they choose to do it. No, that it, he's obviously put it back the wrong way because they need yeah, I love that touch. something for her, for us and the audience to know, Oh, fuck. Okay. So she's going to see that. Whereas this, so this do, yeah. So I was going to say, just, just to get a different trigger. Well, there's a few things like so that in the so all that happens really early on, like early on in his captivity, and in the book. Um, so, like I said, he gets out a couple of times, and then it's just some, like a random thing out of the blue. But then it turns out when she does the flip moment, um, she uh, it's revealed that she's known all the time, all the, all along that he's gotten out, um, and has oh, gotten okay. out several times, and and it's just one of those. She's just wanted to, ah, uh, you know play with him a little bit like a cat and a mouse yeah. kind of thing and just kind of yeah um yeah but that's so, the funny thing because she's representing drugs and then he's hiding his drugs under the mattress isn't he every yes. time to, yeah yeah so it's it's a weird combination it is it is there's a bit of a there's a bit of a flip thing going on there um yeah so it's kind of a it's it's, it's an interesting journey that that takes in that respect there's something else i was going to touch on with annie Wilkes's character too I can't. I know there's a there's a lot on, and I I did I did semi watch this recently, and I'm trying to remember the bit where he got, he he finds the book, which is her book of like a memorabilia stuff, and it, it's revealed that she used to be a nurse, and there's all these suspicious deaths and stuff um, attached to hers in her nursing career. But that in, yeah. the, in the novel that obviously goes into a because it can't afford to goes into a lot more detail as to that she went to court over it, but got out on a technicality or something like that. And, um, and that it's not only happened once, but it's happened numerous times. So she's a repeat offender, um, when it comes to that. So, um, but always noting like, like there was always something a little bit unhinged about her as well. And there's, I think there's memory, there's pockets in there about her family too. Cause she had a brother. And I don't think that's touched on in, in this, in the movie, yeah, I in, can't remember if it talks about it or not. Apparently, in the film, they gave her like a, a backstory um, yeah. that wasn't ever voiced in the film. Yes, where she was sort of abused as a child, and then yeah. uh, by her father, and that they, um, and that sort of explains why she was, you know, so abusive in the yeah. in the you know to the people she was caring for. Yes, yeah, yeah, and so like that. And that's kind of one of the good things about any any character that's deemed um, evil. Um, there needs to be a... It, the biggest trick um, is to convince the audience that there is an, an actual necessary means to their actions. So, like, they're, they are, they're doing this because either they've been corrupted or, you know, or something's happened to them because you then start buying into the reason they would behave this way. 
what I mean by that is like when you look at your typical slasher flicks, like your Jasons and your Michaels, they are they are just killing machines. They kill for the sake of killing. You don't, they, there's no need for this backstory about it. They just they for entertainment's sake, you run away from them because they're a shark and they're going to kill you. Whereas, <laughs> whereas um, in this case, it's it's a bit it's a lot more psychological because there's a reason for the way they behave and why they, the reason why they act, and so you believe their journey a lot more you know so yeah Yeah, it's Um, motivation isn't it yeah exactly exactly um so and i i know i i massively kind of we've gone off on this tangent but i just want to come back to the farnsworth moment again only because um in correlation to or in contrast i should say to the novel that character doesn't exist but we the moment where like a the first death happens in the novel is when a state trooper turns up at the house a bit similar and he's questioning what you know he's there to kind of investigate the disappearance and he's basically just going around door knocking is what he's doing to try and find out if paul sheldon has driven down this way and uh paul sees him from his window and he does a whole banging on the glass of his bedroom window to get the guy's attention. And there's a moment and the way it's written in the book, and I'm, I'm not reading it word for, I'm not saying it word for word, but it's like he, the cop, the state trooper guy looks at Paul Sheldon and then he pulls out a photo of Paul Sheldon. And it's like, this moment was like, that's the guy I'm looking for. <laughs> um, as it, you know, as the cogs are turning over. Um, yeah. And at which point, I'm just going to try and find the uh, the point where it talks about it. Cool. So, yeah, so he's trying to get his, this guy's attention. And uh, and at this point, uh, Annie comes out on a lawnmower and mows the guy down <laughs> on a lawnmower. Um, and, Holy uh, shit, that's incredible. I wish they kept that in somehow. <laughs> I know, it's like, fuck. Um, and it's like, because there's something like... It's, he kind of stumbles, and that's the and that's the point. He kind of falls over, and that and that's it. He's you know he's he's a goner. So it's not one of these like Austin Powers moment where he's going to get mowed down by a, a, a you know like a steamroller. No, um, it, it's it's not <laughs> one of those. Emotion. Yeah, it's not one of those. It's like it happens actually quite quickly, um, and yeah, like kind of completely comes out and um, and mows this guy down, um, and, and like I think. I think it does even talk about it chewing up the guy's face. So like it completely, you know, destroys him. And then she, hell. she gets hold of the body and literally pulls him into, um, the barn, um, to kind of get rid of the body essentially. Cause she lives on like a bit of a farm land. That's why she's got the pig called misery, but she's also got misery, a, couple, yeah. a couple of cows as well. Um, so also called misery. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, misery one and misery two. Um, so yeah. So, that kind of all happens um, and and then he's realising that, yeah, look, he's fucked. But then in the book, he's like, because she comes out and just kind of calmly just kind of cleans up um, everything uh, to get rid of all the evidence. And he's just like, fuck, I'm, I'm going to be stuck here. But then he realises that she's forgotten to clean the lawnmower. Um, so he's oh, like, gross. All, all it takes is for someone else to come out and investigate and they'll see that they, they'll be... Or, uh, blood kind of and matter <laughs> attached to this lawnmower. Um, anyway, so so that that's the shock moment. Like that's your Richard Farns moment. Like, but you know, but there are other cops that come out later on, right? So um, to kind of, but I'll get to that down the track. Um, but yeah, so there was there was a big kind of big difference in in the way that comes about. Um, so coming back then to talk about the when he escapes from the room, uh, he, he he as I said, he does do it on a few occasions. I, you know, I realise that like, we haven't actually said that. You know, the the big quote from um, Annie Wilkes is like, "You're my number one fan." Um, I'm your number one fan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I said you didn't I? I'm your number one fan um, because yeah, like, I mean, this is the moment like. Even when, uh, in the book, when we first uh, are aware of Annie Wilkes' presence, it's after Paul Sheldon's car accident in this deep snow. And 
the only thing he remembers is this foul, foul breath breathing life back into him um, as she's trying to give him the, the, the you know, the uh, CPR. Kiss of life. Yeah. yeah, and the kiss of life. Um, and, I, and that really sticks with you because, like, it's like it, this, the, you know, this visual kind of uh, component of what something really can nastily <laughs> smell like. Um, so we, we already know that before it's even begun, like she's, she's not going to be a great person um, because of the, the physical description of her. Um, but yeah, so then we, uh, then we kind of get to this bit where, you know, the escaping of the house and we get the backstory because he sees the newspaper clippings that we were just talking about and it's revealed that she's a serial killer. Um, and, and she would, uh, and it's actually revealed that among her victims were her neighboring family, her own father she killed. She killed her college roommate. Uh, she apparently killed a hitchhiker who previously stayed at her house. That goes into quite a lot of detail on, not a lot of detail. That's just talking about a bit more detail in the book. Um, and all this is happening while she worked as a nurse. So she got, has this kind of real, plays this kind of, I'm going to fix you up and then I'm going to destroy you kind of thing going on. Um, and uh, there always tends to be like these elderly or critically injured patients or infants. There's like something like 10 or 11 infants that she kills as well in the course of time when she's a nurse. So yeah, she's, she's not so a nice people person. who yeah. people who are less likely to fend for themselves and, you know, can't look after themselves. And exactly. Exactly. So she yeah. low hanging fruit. So yeah, exactly. So now, now, now we come to like the big point of difference. So the bit where, she, you know, she reveals that she's known that Paul has been leaving the room and in the book, this is where she, cobbles him right so she gets mm. the, uh, she gets she has his like uh legs tied down and he gets, she pulls out a big mallet and whacks the fuck out of his legs so that there's one sh- quick shot where you see the left foot i think it is bend like 90 degrees as she hits it yeah go sorry on. mate i thought you said in in the book you no, mean in, in the movie right in the movie sorry a big fun yeah in yeah, the, in the movie just... that happens because in the book she cuts his feet off um, that's why yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, big big difference and then she cauterizes them with a with a blowtorch so she cuts his feet off with an axe um and she calls it hobbling him um mm. uh so basically he has no no feet um for the rest of the novel so he is even more dependent on her um to get around mm. which is in with uh, having you know you've obviously read the, the book and the yeah. details there for me the hobbling is so brutal, even with the mallet, because, you know, you can imagine the force behind that, the weight, the wooden block, the size yeah. of the mallet, everything like that. Whereas, obviously, as brutal as it would be to lose your foot, it, it almost feels like the mallet's worse. I know it's not, but it just, I don't know, maybe because I've seen it visually, but yeah. for you, having watched and, and read, which which for you is more brutal I, 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 I get what you're saying because I remember from the movie and I must have forgotten a bit about the cutting the feet off when I first read it but for, for me the movie bit always stuck with me that moment was always because you know it's, it's a pretty iconic moment in the film um, but having then reread the book I don't know I'm a, I'm a sucker for, for, the, for the gore kind of side of things because I, <laughs> I and my head automatically goes to audition the J, J horror film in 1999 with a <laughs> where, where you see her kind of slicing off this guy's foot with a grot wire um, oh. so, um, so and, and the pain that it goes through I don't know whether that was a nod to misery in that respect um, I don't know I, I could be completely off, off the ballpark ball with that one but um, I think I the, think Goldman had a problem with it, didn't he? Apparently, he didn't want to do the chopping off the foot. Yeah, probably. Or was it Rob Reiner? One of the, both of them, I think. Probably, yeah. I, I say it's probably both because then this is the thing because um, it would also get to the point where um, later on in the novel, um, sh- she chops off his thumb um, as well. Because Why? And, and that's what I'm just trying to remember. I'm just trying, am I on the novel bit here? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, yeah. So this is a few months after the, um, the bit where she's chopped his feet off. He complains because 
when she when she gives him the typewriter, the letter N is missing. Now they do do that in the book. She says, "I bought this you know, mm. secondhand typewriter, but the N's missing." And he's, and he's and she goes, "But you know how important is the N?" And he does that whole, "Well, it's got uh, my favorite nurse in the world has two of them in her name." Goes, <laughs> oh, yeah. you're a kidder! Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, in the novel, it, it goes beyond that because the typewriter is really old and shoddy and it keeps losing keys. So like it starts off with a name and then it's like, a, I want to say it's like a T-Nex or something like that. And he just, get, he just gets pissed off with it at one point and he just starts complaining about the typewriter keys are broken and he refuses to tell Annie how the, the novel is going to end. So she just then grabs an electric knife, cuts his thumb off um, <laughs> in response to it. Wow. So this then ties into the fact that, you know, you know, it's it's this uh, power thing that she has over him. It's a way of winning back power. He's trying to get power over her. And so she then destroys that by, you know, taking away something that he needs and a, another appendage, you know. So, yeah, so in that sense, it makes sense in the book. But I think once you've already chosen not to do the feet bit, uh, you can't really move that any further in, in the film you know um, you thought that would have affected his writing which is part of the thing right yeah yeah that's Losing right exactly thumb. so he does he does struggle with you know trying to trying to adjust with not having this anymore um his left mm. left thumb um yeah so it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting point of difference that's what i think i said to you off record there are some notable differences that come along the way and the, this is particularly one of them where that happens so yeah so there's there's a there's a couple of things that's going on there now i guess like the the key kind of if we then kind of cut back to like the the overall art from annie's point of view in this is that you know she, paul sheldon is uh you know she is his number one fan and uh she has this opportunity to bring back new life breathe new life into paul sheldon and uh, and look after him when she gets hold of the fast cars manuscript that he's written up and it being this whole cockadoodly kind of uh take on and she's not impressed um and then she after that then she reads the uh in the, the now i'm going off the novel though after she's read the transcript that she's not impressed with she then reads misery um, as in, like, the, where he's killed off the character, because it's just oh, yeah. uh, that's just come out in the, in the you know in the shops, and she's only just gotten hold of it, and so she says, and that's where she does the first big flip is like, you know, I can't believe you did this, and they do it really like Kathy Bates does this really well uh, in the in the film where she just it's the first point where she completely ah oh, apart from the spilling the soup moment, it's the first point where she really kind of goes off off the dial and loses it with him saying you can't you know you dirty birdie um and really kind of <laughs> lays into him um and and that's where she kind of retaliates uh, i think in the movie where she then gets him to burn the book so and that this is right i always get confused so in the novel she gets him to burn the fast cars book but i think in the movie she gets him to burn the misery book. I get. I don't know. I get confused. Yeah, um, she does. I don't, there's no reference to the fast car stuff. In the yeah. Movie. So it's um, and, and like so he spent all this time writing the book, and I, and this is where I think it, there's a bit of a contradiction in the movie, because in the novel, so the misery's uh, not misery's child, whatever the book it is that has already gone out to shops, the one she uh, Annie's complained about, where she, the, the misery character is killed at the end. Um, so that's what she gets upset about, but she gets him to burn the manuscript of fast cars. Right now in the movie, she, the manuscript is the book of, that we're talking about. The misery, the last misery bit, the book where she, he has killed off misery. And when she bur- gets him to burn the manuscript, and obviously there's a point where he's like trying to fib to her going, Oh, it's already been sent out. And, but it is the only copy, so he's got this moment. And that's the same with the Fast Cars book he's written. It's the only copy he's got because that is how he writes. He writes it, then goes to his agent. And so he then um, 
does all that stuff and and she gets him to burn that so when she then tells him to rewrite misery properly uh in both versions she does that in the novel and, and in the film um and in the novel it kind of says you need to, she she says the same line in the movie and this is where it contradicts itself so she basically says because he tries he tries his first attempt of rewriting it uh, and bringing misery back to life and she says you're cheating it you're not you're, you're doing like they did in those old, uh, you know, those old films where, you know, the serials where it would end of a cliffhanger at the end. And she mentions the guy going off the cliff and crashing. And that's when, um, when that kind of occurs. And this is when he, um, uh, she kind of mentions that that's what he's done with the book. And so she says he has to write it all again. And he's like, and he realizes she's right. In in the novel, he's like, "You're right. Yeah, I have I have tried to cheat my audience, and I'm not doing it properly, and I'm not doing any justice." So, and that's when he. Um, but it, and what I mean by the contradiction part is that she says the same thing in the film, where she says, "You have to start from the beginning. You have to start from the point where you have killed misery." You have to start from the grave. And if so, if he's then right, if he's rewriting that book, he hasn't killed her off. Do you see what I mean? So there was a point where I went, yeah, yeah. I was like, that doesn't, make, that, that doesn't make sense. She's, no sense. She, she's, <laughs> she's not dead anymore if you've burnt the misery book. And that's what I meant by I got confused about, hold on, what manuscript did they say they burnt in the, in the movie? Yeah, anyway, which one? Yeah. So, and I, I know that's probably a little bit of a quibble, but it kind of stuck with me this time around. I went, hmm, that, that doesn't work. Hmm. Yeah, so there's all that kind of stuff that's going on. Uh, and I guess, like, the last thing to kind of really kind of talk about is, is probably, um, uh, other than those kind of key moments in the film, um, is the very last scene. So, like, you know, we were talking about when... Um, so we've, we, we've had the death of, um, of uh, the Richard Farnsworth character and... Um, He's, uh, this is where he comes up with the plan to try, uh, initially tries to, in the movie, he tries to drug her with the wine, uh, putting the tablets in, but she knocks over the wine, right? Very cliche moment, knocks over the wine that's got yeah, drugs, yeah. The drugs in it. She goes off, but then he then threatens to then light the, the fuse. Um, oh, yeah, holding hold the, the manuscripts here. Yeah, and burn it. And then that happens and she tries... We have that big kind of climax bit where she tries to stab it out. She catches on fire for a little bit, manages to, you know, um, stamp that out. And then um, and then there's a bit of a kind of a, a, a scuffle. He gets, I think he gets, uh, yeah, so as she's doing that, he then raises the typewriter the and bashes it over her head. Um, and you think she's out cold, um, but then she, um, then she gets up and they have a big kind of another big fight. Uh, and all good horror movies. You and, know. and all good horror movies. And then he ends up stuffing the mouth of burnt novel in, in retaliation. Uh, sorry, stuffing the burnt novel into her mouth uh, where she starts kind of um, uh, choking on it, essentially. Um, and a bit more of a scuffle, but then she gets up and you think she's kind of overpowered him, but she had somehow then trips over him, hits her head on the tri- typewriter, killing herself. Mm. And he then calls out the room. And then she attacks him again uh, yep. and grabs a metal doorstop. And that's when uh, he, uh, so Paul does that. And then he starts bashing her face in and he finally does kill her. Um, <laughs> so, so what do you think of, I mean, before I then jump back to where the, no, where the novel goes and the difference with that, what, what is your thoughts on, on that kind of exchange? Yeah, that's an incredible scene because he's there. They almost have like this really sort of sweet moment where she's doting on him and he's, writing and doing what he does best and yeah. you know take that scene out of context and you think oh that's quite cute you know <laughs> yeah, yeah and it's for me it's it's the calculation of him obviously having nothing else to do other than plan his escape yeah and so he's obviously worked up this plan where he's you know gonna write this novel and hold it to ransom and and just the the thought of him going to all that effort to then hold it over well Hold it over her head, I should say, <laughs> yeah. um, with, without the deliberate pun. Yeah. Um, to then 
just the physicality of picking up that typewriter and the sounds and it's just it's just so br- and again it's it's that dull kind of um brutality similar to the the sledgehammer where you know there's not lots of blood and gore and things like that and that's what i remember as a kid kind of even reading some of the books and watching the movies i expected probably more in the movies like blood and guts because when you're reading the book you kind of or any sort of horror book as a as a young teen yeah um you kind of think it's a way of getting away without you know a way of getting away with watching horror movies because you're obviously not allowed to watch them yeah so you can read them because you're reading you know yeah, yeah. um and, it's educational and sort of yeah. yeah that's it and yeah. you know as as yourself because you've read the movie uh, it might feel dull down to you but for me it's just really severe and quite yeah um, a, a brutal and especially when the, the whole time I'm kind of weighing you know um could he take her in a fight she's got like this this um this strength to her yeah and he's obviously you know debilitated yeah um and that's why you try and weigh those two like oh you know, if he's on the floor, she's on the floor, then he's kind of got that advantage. And, um, you know, if, if he, if she is dead, how's he going to get out of there? What's going to drag himself through the snow or make a phone call, you know? Yeah. And yeah. you, and this, all these sort of decisions and thought processes happening, you know, a couple of seconds while you're watching it and obviously still enjoying the film. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously when you're in the book, it's kind of a bit more labored and, and um, you'd, you'd obviously get some great detail in there too, but, no, I, I just love that scene, especially for the simplicity of it. For yeah, yeah. you know, smashing someone over a head and then grabbing whatever's to hand is just wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and and for her to have um, to be so focused and it means so much to her, um, you know, that it draws attention from everything else. Nothing else matters. She's got to have this thing done. And, yeah, uh, yeah. That the power. Of, that he kind of has over her, but she has over him is, yeah. is great. Well, and something I neglected to mention at this point too, like there is an ultimatum she's given him because she's like, as soon as it's written, I'm gonna, I'm basically gonna kill you, and then I'm gonna kill myself, um, and that's gonna be the end of it. You know, it's like this because because oh, yeah, because yeah. like you know she's got you know she can't she knows that people will be searching for the Richard Farnsworth character essentially, and so. Yeah, there there is no way out. They the only way they can complete their journey is for him to finish the book, um, and they would have finished their journey together. Um, yeah, which is kind of a poetic way in her eyes to kind of uh, finish this cruel, cruel world that she's been living in. Um, so the other yeah. thing, the other thing I was going to touch on with that though, then so like the difference with the ending in the novel is that. Um, uh, so he does, there's a bit where, so after the state trooper disappears, there is, there are a couple of other cops that come out, um, to investigate. Um, and when they do, he's kind of, uh, I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head, but he's kind of forced into the, he's, uh, yes, that's right. So she, she is aware that people will be coming in search for him. So she moves Paul into the basement so that he can be undetected uh, when they mm. come round. And so we do get these other two cops to kind of come over to investigate. Um, and uh, I want to say that during the struggle that occurs in the climax, um, the, poli- the police have come back at this point uh, in search of the dead cop. Um, and this is where, so the struggle's already happened and we get the point of view from, obviously from, our narrator, Paul Sheldon. So he's, he's bashed her over the head um, with the typewriter and left, left. And so like, he's got no feet. So he's then had to crawl out of the room to escape from. And he climbs into the bathroom and shuts the bathroom and he hides in there because he, but he doesn't know if she's dead or not. Like he just presumes he's left her for dead. And this is where the other cops turn up um, and they find, um, They've actually found, so there's this whole nightmare scenario, sorry, before the cops turn up where he's like hiding in there and he just doesn't know if she's about to come for him. And he drifts in and out of sleep because he's in pain and stuff like that. So there's this cocoon moment before the cops come. And they come and they basically find him and they basically explain to him that um, they found Annie 
dead, but not in the room where he left her. She's crawled out of the room and she's made her way into the barn. Um, at, apparently on the way to find a chainsaw to come back and, to come back and kill Paul, but she ends up oh, du- dying of of baboons outside in the barn because of the head wounds. So she so she still wow. managed to get out, but yeah, she dies not where he thinks she's died. Um, is that- does yeah. that sorry when when you're reading that does that sort of feel like I love the way you've laid it out to me now I think that's that's actually a really great twist on how a horror movie ends it's like he did kill her but you know she was so close to coming back and getting him and uh, that's brilliant but as as a reader of the book and you've obviously gone through you know it's not a small book um, no, yeah do you sort of feel a bit cheated that there is not that sort of climactic ending or for you, you still sort of... I don't know, because I think, I feel like it builds up to this point because it's, it, it, it's, and we're kind of, we're trying to crowbar this thing into like a one hour and a bit kind of podcast discussion, but he is essentially like um, a, a prisoner in this place. So a lot of the story kind of is, is this built up pressure on him in this environment and trying to survive and outwit the person that is detaining him to try and survive yeah. and live for another day. So all of that, I don't think it is cheated because it does, it feels like a, an actual struggle and it plays on the, on his psychology at this point too, because he doesn't know, uh, as I said, whether he's lived through the ordeal or not like this. She's just this thing that just keeps on coming and she's gotten away with so many other things in the past. Like, you know, yeah. it, and it, they, they, the character I was uh, the kind of throw off kind of character I was telling you about where she talked about somebody that uh, lived with her for a bit um, and she kind of oh, the, kills him yeah. as well. Like that, that's in his, that's in the back of his mind. Like he's like constantly going, am I going to be that, like the next kind of victim essentially, you know? So he is in this constant state of paranoia. And I think that's what plays in nicely. Both the movie and the novel does this. So in the end of the movie, there's that moment where he's back with his agent, which we haven't mentioned is played by Lauren Bacall, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> which I, I completely forgot she was in this until that. The, yeah, it, 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 was the, it was the credit that came up and said, and featuring Lauren Bacall or wherever it was. And I went, Lauren Bacall? Yeah. I was like, who the fuck's she in it? And then obviously revealed that she's <laughs> the agent. I was like, oh, all right. Um, Anyway, so, yeah, so that whole scene where he's in the cafe talking to um, his agent and then we get uh, Annie Wilkes coming out, um, you know, pushing the, the dessert trolley. Um, and then, you know, they, she pulls up next to Paul Sheldon's character and says, you know, I'm your number one fan. Um, yeah. and, then, and then it cuts, you see his reaction, and then it cuts back to the actual waitress, so it's not yeah. Annie Wilkes. Um, you know, and he's like you know he's i think he just says something along the lines of that's very sweet of you in his response you know to her comment but saying she's his number one fan and that's where the film closes credits now the only slight change to the novel is that um you know he's <laughs> he's but he's in the apartment when he has the moment where he so he comes back home he's just finished right he's finished writing misery's return so he has completed the book oh and he doesn't the paint the when he does the burning of the manuscript it's not actually the the book he's burnt he's kept that somewhere else um and he's oh, okay. he just burnt a fake book essentially um and uh yeah so he he publishes misery's return it becomes his an international bestseller um basically uh born out the fact that not only did he sell those books well anyway, but because of what's happened to him, it becomes a massive thing. Right. And, um, so he's got, he's walking on a prosthesis, uh, but he keeps having these nightmares about Annie and he continues to have the withdrawal from painkillers still is constant. Um, he's trying to cope with alcoholism. Um, and he's, he has writer's block still. Um, and then he goes home. Um, and he uh, sees Annie. I think he, oh, like the doors open or something, and he thinks that's Annie. And he has this visual moment. And then he literally, I think he kind of blocks it out or something like that. And he sits down in front of a typewriter. And then he's suddenly able to write again. So he's had this writer's block for months. And then he can, yeah, he's, he can create again. So he's almost like, oh, he's that's cool. Willing to be free and unbound. Um, yeah. So, and then, like, oh, we mentioned um, 
going back to what I said about the dark half, there's a very similar theme there too, because it's an, it's an author that's got his own demons and he's trying to kill off this character that he's written about, which unbeknownst to him is his, um, his uh, twin manifestation of himself um, that's been kind of born. <laughs> um, and, and he has he, he has to destroy that at the end too. So it's a very similar thing. And in order to destroy it, he's then free to write again. So it's a very there's some couple of common themes that are going on there. Um, so yeah, so we've reached the climax of the of the film there. So what what was your your take on it? Like you know, what was your feelings when you watched it the first time, and how did that compare to when you watched it recently? Does it still hold up to you? Yeah, it definitely still holds up, and. It's it's funny because I would have watched it, you know, in my uh, sort of early teens ish, mid mid teens, I guess. Um, and you know, just because it had the sort of the Stephen King moniker to it, your name to it, I'd have gone, "Oh, okay, great, that's that's what I wanted to watch." And, um, but you know, it's still a relatively slow film for. And you know, it's, someone it's nearly to... it's nearly like two hours long. Like, I, is I it remember, really? Two yeah, and I, <laughs> yeah. I remember I remember thinking that because I was like. I think whenever I was going to stick it on before the record, I was like, oh, I'll put it on then. And then I went to do it and it was like, oh, it's two hours. And I think I only had like an hour and a half free. And I was like, well, okay, I'll have to put it off for another time. I'll watch something else. <laughs> it, um, yeah, yeah. So I didn't realize it was that long. And and like, yeah, that has some slow moments, but I I don't remember feel, even this time around feeling like it was a slow, like it was a long movie. Yes, it's a slow movie, but no. I didn't feel like it was a long movie. Um, yeah, that and that's sense. it because... So, yeah. No, no, completely, and that and that's how I felt watching it both times. Because mm. you know, even when you know what's going to happen, it's still it's still very well made, and and you know, I yeah. think both the performances are well, the main performances are incredible. Um, ah, yeah, you like, know, you, yeah, you you completely believe who they are, and you believe that she'll do whatever she she can, and her motive, and that's that's one of the things that always you know freaked me out about this film is just the way she could flip instantly. You know, she could be really lovely and beautiful and, oh, and yeah. warm and, and then just like bang, comes in the next minute, you know, you, you dirty birdie sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, it's no wonder It's no wonder that not only does she get nominated but won those big accolades in, uh, in the film industry. Do you yeah. think that's deserved, like her win? Do you think they were? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like apparently she's got um, quite a theatrical, back, like a stage theatre sort of background. Yeah. Um, Compared to you know, Khan is more sort of uh, cinema based, and and that's one thing that that blew my mind is that they made a play about this. I know, with, I, was literally, um, I was literally just going to say that. Yeah, go on, you say that. You, crazy. you, you, you no, did no, it real. Oh, it was just like that they made a play about this with Bruce Willis as, yeah. well, as the lead. I'm like, how have I never heard about this? Bruce, this is Bruce Willis and Laurie Metcalf, and I'm like, I need to yeah. see this. I had no idea. Oh, God. And um, Metcalf, like, Metcalf was nominated for uh, a Tony Award, which is obviously the theatrical equivalent of, of the Oscars. Um, yeah, she, in, she'd in be States. incredible in that role. Yeah. You, yeah. you can imagine her, like, even, um, yeah, when you see her just going a little bit, you know, crazy in some of her roles, that she'd well, really just go all out. And we, We've seen, um, her do, seen her do that in Scream too, haven't we? So like, you know, it's all, oh. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it was crazy. They built, uh, like, a rotating stage. Wow. And they, they called it the Wheel of Misery. <laughs> so, you know, nice. when someone would, nice. would walk from one room to another, the whole platform would sort of rotate and... Yeah. Anyway, sorry, that sound, sounded really cool. But um, yeah, and the good thing is Bruce Willis wouldn't have to do much acting in it. He could just sit in bed. And, <laughs> although yeah. that's that's one thing that um, apparently James Caan just found really hard was he thought it was torture, like sitting in a bed for I think it was something like fifteen weeks to make it. Yeah, um, and I, and I can know. get I get that, and I guess that's the thing. And I was going to touch on that as well because there isn't like he has to as an actor that role is purely relying on the facial expressions and mannerisms in order mm. to emote because they, they are bound, you know. Um, but what I like about it is that it, it, it has to be subdued in that way to contrast against the eccentricity of Annie Wilkes' character uh, for that to kind of play out because by being that constrained, it just makes her big moments even bigger and not in a far-fetched way, it just kind of, really elevates just how manic Annie Wilkes can get. Um, yeah. And that takes and, a lot for the James, for someone like James Kahn has to be on it, like really on it with, with, with his portrayal in order for that to work. Because if he doesn't, then 
Annie Wilkes could seem really too eccentric. Yeah, and, and also what you're saying before in her performance is, now you're talking about it, I'm just thinking to, to act with someone who's lying down the whole time, that's got to be a ball ache, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you play <laughs> off something. mannerisms and yeah. yeah, gestures and, you know, there's, yeah. there's moving around the room and all that sort of stuff. It's just like you're talking to a bed, essentially, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, for half of it. I'm like, yeah. God, and, and to get an Oscar for that, that's, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, I mean, if Clint, and, and Eastwood, yeah. if Clint Eastwood can talk to a chair... I think um, I think <laughs> any, anything's possible, mate. Yeah, sorry, I, yeah, I, I, I cut you up then. So, what were you saying? No, no, that that's cool. And, and the funny thing was talking about the, the the performances and everything. It's um, I was just going through and researching some of it before before obviously we recorded. And um, yeah, have you seen the shopping list of actors who originally thought for the role uh, for James, for James no, Cunt? I don't I'll, know. I'll if pull I did. it up here. Just just so you got them here. Uh, Kevin Klein, Michael oh, Douglas, yeah. Harrison Ford, Dustin Hoffman, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Richard Dreyfuss, Gene Hackman, and Robert Redford. They all said no wow. yeah. um, to Paul Sheldon, which is pretty incredible when you think about it and how good James Kahn is it. Yeah. And I'm sure those people could play it really well. But, um, you know, to go through all those, uh, like, I think Warren Beatty was supposed to do it, but then he had to do um, Dick Tracy. But oh. he gave some sort of <laughs> tips on the character and how he imagined the character evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so just just on the film, on the whole, I, I still really enjoy it. I think it's yeah. um, it, it's so tense as well, considering you know he it's more or less based in one room. Um, yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, you know he he occasionally crawls out, and it's just how tense it can be just to leave that one room, and mm. um, and how how believable it all kind of is. Like it's obviously a massive coincidence that the person man who you know. Um, obsesses over him, manages to find him. Yeah. Um, forgive me if I missed the subtle subplot where she, you know, she flattened his tire or threw something in the road, and <laughs> you know she's been stalking him forever. But that's that's probably a sequel, maybe or a prequel. I don't know. Well, um, I mean, like she mentions it. Not, I don't think she mentions it in the novel, but in the movie, she just says, "I've been kind of stalking you a little bit." You know, I often drive up yeah. outside your room and you know wonder what the great Paul Sheldon's doing. Um, <laughs> yeah. which I kind of like that because so, that does kind of play nicely into the reason why she's there and that's not in the novel oh, yeah, it is course. purely coincidental that she stumbles across it yeah, or, or at yeah. least it's not mentioned that she's been stalking him you know so mm. yeah but no no like I said just, just a, a really great film and um, yeah just amazing performances so yeah definitely yeah. Um, compared to how I, I don't for me, I think it's aged really well. I don't think much has changed my opinion of it since I first watched it. Just, yeah, uh, same. Yeah. yeah. So would you, on that note then, if nobody's watched it, would you recommend it to to them? And do you think a modern going audience would still appreciate it? Yeah, 100%. I think as long as you don't um, go in there thinking you're going to expect a blood and gore sort of, you know, horror. Yeah. Um, which is yeah, which which often threw me around as a kid when I was watching a oh, Stephen King movie. Wow, you know, <laughs> yeah, it turns yeah. out to be something really surreal like Tommy Knockers or like you Dolores know, Claiborne um, or something like that. This, which yeah, is, that's who, it, yeah. Uh, had um, uh, Kathy Bates in it. Yeah, which mm. he wrote for apparently. So yeah, correct me if I'm apparently. I which think is you're right. Pretty big mm. deal. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And um, yeah, I, I definitely recommend it to anyone because um, uh, I think you know that that kind of the tension he builds is uh it gives it that sort of horror presence you don't necessarily need the blood and gore you almost need the threat of menace you know the um oh my god if if she catches him out here he's he's a goner you yeah. know you don't need to have her standing there with an axe over his head saying i'm gonna kill you yeah and something as simple as the penguin mm. being facing the wrong way is just incredible because i'm sure if you know Either of us were in that, the same situation. We're like, oh shit! Quick, put it back. Run, you know. Or yeah, back to uh, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. It really plays on that tension nicely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she's so meticulous that you can believe that she would notice that as well. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, no, definitely recommend. Yeah, definitely. One hundred percent. I agree with you as well. It's, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I enjoyed the first time round. Enjoyed rereading the book, and I enjoyed it. Uh, enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed uh, rewatching the film as well. Um, so I think uh, we're going to kind of uh, bow out on that. I think we've come to the point of casting our thoughts and views uh, from the Sojourns of Horror team on Misery and wrapping that up. It sounds like we're both in agreement that we would recommend this. If you haven't seen it, uh, definitely go out and check it. 
if you have seen it and you equally agree with us, let us know. If you don't, you think it was an uh, overrated film, equally hit us up. Let us know what you think of the film. We're always kind of too e- eager to hear a uh, second review of the film itself. Uh, we do hope you've enjoyed listening to our chat over this one, which is, as I said, our final uh, podcast episode for the season. Thanks for listening. As always, I'm your host, Swan Murte, and I'd like to again extend my thanks to my offsider, Watch It Wombats, Nick Holford. Thanks for coming aboard, sir. Absolute pleasure as always, mate. So great to uh, hang out and talk films. Likewise, always good. Thanks again. Goodbye. Cheers. You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Music supplied by Peter Nezik. For more discussions or podcasts, head over to surgeonsofhorror.com or head over to our Facebook and Twitter sites for the latest news and updates.